what what do we say when we say reliability? What what really does what what does that mean? First, the reliability is a relative term in my mind, and、uh, I mention this to the audience every time when I、um, uh, had a chance or teach my professional development courses. So I wanted the audience to understand,、uh, not looking for or search for、uh, a absolute number. And、uh, I, I think it's、uh, it, 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 when we look at the you mentioned a lot of publications. Some publications, uh, uh, perhaps uh, you know, very、really, very、really、less than ideal、uh, or less than desirable. It really not teaching that much or not really providing enough information. Looking at one single number, so reliability, pragmatically, particular,、uh, in, in particular, is based on three domains: the time. Meaning how long, an environment, like a use case, service conditions, conditions, functionality, target performance. So that is saying the product should be designed, manufactured, and used for a target reliability. That's my guest, Dr. Jenny Huang. Next on Reliability Matters. Welcome to Reliability Matters, a podcast for the electronic assembly industry. Each episode covers topics related to reliability, best practices, and environmentally responsible assembly techniques, with insights from experts across the electronic assembly industry. Now, here's your host, Mike Conrad. To list all of Dr. Jenny Huang's credentials would take an entire episode, if if not more. Dr. Huang's Wide-ranging career encompasses international business operations, sustained leadership in worldwide manufacturing and technology services, innovative research, intellectual property management, global leadership positions, as well as corporate and university governance. Dr. Huang's wide-ranging career encompasses international business operations, sustained leadership in worldwide manufacturing and technology services, innovative research, intellectual property management. Global leadership positions, as well as corporate and university governance. Dr. Huang held senior executive positions with Lockheed Martin, SCM Corporation, Sherwin Williams, and was the CEO of International Electronic Materials Corporation, as well as co-founder of several entrepreneurial companies. Currently, her company provides business, technology, and manufacturing solutions to the global industry. She has served as an advisor to many Fortune 500 multinational companies, as well as the U.S. government programs. Her formal education includes Harvard Business School's Executive Program, Columbia University Business School's Corporate Governance Program, and four academic degrees: a Ph.D., an M.S., an M.A., and a B.S. in Engineering and Sciences from Case Western Reserve University, Columbia University, Kent State Liquid Crystal Institute. And Chang Kung University, respectively. She was the first female to earn a doctorate from Case Western Reserve University's Engineering School, Materials Science and Engineering, and has served on the university's Board of Trustees since 1996. Here's my interview with Dr. Jenny Huang. Jenny Huang, welcome to the program. Well, thank you, Mike, and、uh, thanks for inviting me. I'm really looking forward to our、uh, conversation this morning. As am I.、Uh, we have met many, many times, usually at conventions or symposiums, trade shows, things like that, and we've had brief aisle conversations.、Um, so it's nice to actually、um, virtually sit down with you and、uh, and ask you some more in-depth questions. I, you have、uh, been a staple in this industry for many, many years. I've read lots of your articles over the years, and.、Um, And and listen to some of your talks over the years, and、uh, you always are up to date and、uh, very insightful. So I'm happy to have you as a guest on this show. So you published not too long ago, although in today's times, just a few months seems like a few years. But you published back in October of 2019 an article entitled "Revisiting Globalization," and I'll, I'll I'll make this kind of a long intro here: "Revisiting Globalization: Technology, Jobs, Trade." Not and you write in that article not being different from the past 15 years in the long run, innovation and competitiveness are keys to a constantly rejuvenating economy. Only a strong economy retains and creates jobs in an uncertain time, that inevitably picks winners and losers in the race of new technologies, and one that is filled with debate about trade policies and business strategies. 
an open mind to pragmatically assess the practical options is the way to go. So that, that's a that's a big sentence there. My question is, in light of that, which was just a few months ago, uh, with our strong economy now on pause, uh, what, in your opinion, or who, in your opinion, will be the winners and the losers? I think in a way we are uh, kind of lucky uh, uh, consider uh, the circumstances because U.S. economy was strong. And so we started from a high level. And But this stay-at-home uh, economy uh, would affect all businesses, individuals, uh, either directly or indirectly, uh, either in a larger extent or less extent, depends on the industry uh, the sectors. But in general, uh, I feel companies uh, that are able to use this pause, the so-called pause period, to sharpen their business strategy and optimize their operations in creative ways. I think it, the creative is a key word here, are poised to win down the road. So kind of a category of winners and uh, can even emerge stronger. For example, I think about a lot of factories we were we talking about that uh, inevitably um, have to be closed. So to shut down a factory, it is not just to shut, turn off the switch or uh, turn off the furnace and turn off the energy source. I think one can take steps to consider how to improve and how to be benefit from the restart process, including the details and nuances. I think just one of the industrial examples, I'm pretty sure a lot of companies are doing that. And I'm also sure maybe some companies are not. So, so those uh, companies that have literally stayed idle, well, well it's a pause, we, we closed, we, we stay idle, or wait for solutions to come. I think we'll fall behind in this, in, during, during this period, although hopefully it's a very short period, but even one quarter or two quarters in today's world, it would make a make difference. So uh, that's my general feeling about this pause uh, period. So going forward, I think you have a quite of a broad question here. As we all know, the world is still driven by, by the global landscape and by the global competitiveness. So efficiency and effectiveness are key to continued success. So I like to borrow from the quality guru, Peter Drucker. I think he once defined the, the uh, efficiency and effectiveness. I think he said efficiency is doing the things right and effectiveness is doing the right things well. Huh. Yeah, that's a good takeaway. Yeah, I, I mean, you think about what his words is really make uh, really makes a lot of sense. So, uh, in terms of specific sectors, uh, we all know, you know, we will expect the short term, long term, a ripple effects on businesses, on jobs, on trade, and uh, I'm I'm pretty sure, you know, the government is thinking about how to. Uh, deal with the trade going forward, or at least in the short term, right? After uh, hopefully we come out this, uh, you know, this whole uh, pandemic in, in a short period of time. And as well as how to deal with the, with the technology. So the sectors, obviously, you know, any of the services provider, like a cloud provider, the internet, uh, internet provider, they're going to be, you know, very busy and very robustly engaged you know, during this period, perhaps even even uh, thereafter. Yeah, look at the folks at Zoom right now. Uh, the, That's uh, right. You know, look at Zoom. Every every school, every university and and uh, organizations using Zoom and families using the Zoom as, uh, as well. And uh, uh, so it, 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 it just like this, you know, remote communication providers, software, service platform, remote working tools, uh, providers, including electronic hardwares. You know, electronic hardware is still behind all this communication gears. And uh, e-commerce, of course, and uh, all the manufacturers, obviously, of all the personal hygiene products would enjoy and and uh, and uh, uh, perhaps an instant boost. 
Yeah. Well, they've certainly seen uh, the benefit of hoarding. <laughs> Some of those companies. That's right. Yes. You know, I, I, I may have said this on another episode, but, uh, you know, we, you talked about the, um, you know, cloud sharing, um, screen sharing opportunities. And I look at the folks at Zoom. They went from 20 million subscribers, to, as I read it, from 20 million subscribers to 200 million subscribers within, you know, a few weeks. If any w company deserves to get like a, an award or recognition, first first responders, medical workers, of course, they're, they're way in the front of the line. But somewhere in that line ought to be the folks behind Zoom because they have scaled that product just beautifully. They had a few little uh, privacy things which or security things, which they fixed right away. But they have uh, been there for the world uh, to connect the world. And, and it went from an obscure alternative video sharing platform to... Uh, I think the word Zoom will end up being in the Oxford Dictionary later this year as, as a uh, as a verb. You know, I'm, we'll Zoom later. You know, I, I it's a uh, it's amazing to see how at least one company, and I'm sure there are many more. To your point, uh, in in this in these crazy times, how they've they've really just jumped on the bandwagon and 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 came up with a with a product that really helps society and they did it very well. And for most of their customers, they're doing it for free, which is completely amazing. Anyway, sorry, when I, I needed to say that because I just have a lot of respect for that company and the, and, and the people behind it and, and the decisions they're making. Oh yeah. I'm, I'm glad you, you, uh, you mentioned that because, uh, uh, you, you know, if you look at all those say uh, different platforms, uh, at least I personally feel the Zoom is is easiest to use. So basically, you know, sim simplicity works at this, you know, for, for this case. So I think uh, I didn't really uh, survey or study why all the universities, the schools, because all this become online learning right now. And suddenly, and they all choose uh, cho uh, chose Zoom. So I, I realize it's very simple to use for the, for example, like elementary school students, they can just turn on their uh, laptop and then zoom in, right? Right, just one click That's almost. Right. Yeah, <laughs> they've mastered two two different uh, demographics: the young people who can understand things way more complicated, uh, and then the older folks who really rely on simplicity. So they've really got the best of both worlds going there. That's right. Yeah. So there's always a reason for success, right? <laughs> That's right. And there's always an opportunity. And speaking That's of fair. restarting, you mentioned earlier, you know, hopefully soon we'll start restarting um, the economy again. Um, as the COVID-19 crisis shined light on our industry's supply chain, uh, do you think that our industry will make changes uh, to our supply chain model as we emerge from this crisis? Or do you think what we learn from history is we don't learn from history? Well, I, I think perhaps uh, um, inevitably we'll, we'll have some kind of transition of uh, the, the overall supply chain and specifically uh, in, a, in addition to all the medical gears, I uh, think the, the government and uh, business are talking about uh, within our industry, even our uh, the, the, the outside the medical uh, sector, the self-reliance and versus outsourcing perhaps going to be a real subject uh, for the business to uh, to debate and to uh, uh, to reconsider. I'm, I'm saying reconsider doesn't mean uh, one has to change, but at least uh, uh, deserve uh, some deliberation about uh, how much and what should be self-reliant and what should be outsourced, uh, you know, from economics point of view. So I, I think it's going to be, I, I think that uh, overall, the supply chain should have a certain discussion and uh, debate within, you know, each uh, uh, each individual operation. So I, I, I do feel that way. Yeah, in in the in the pandemic world, every country shuts down. So I guess, you know, supply chain doesn't really matter where your stuff come from. If the whole world is shut down, the whole world is shut down. But I but but it did definitely shine some light on it. I think we dodged the big bullet because when China shut down. They shut down around the time of their of, of New Year, so Chinese New Year. So we were already prepared for a at least a two week shutdown, and we and our stocks had reflected that. So if the pandemic had emerged in China in July or September or any other time, that would have 
really shrunk up our, our inventories much more significantly than it did compared to it shutting down when we were prepared for them to shut down. We weren't prepared for them to shut down for six weeks, but we were prepared for them to shut down for two. So we had a little bit extra stock on hand. I think we kind of dodged a bullet there. But it does. I, I think it does definitely shine light on uh, backup contingency plans, things like that. What do you think? Do you think more companies will have employees work from home after this is over? Or do you think everyone will just be ushered, you know, swept back into the uh, cubicles? I think that, that this, uh, the work at home, uh, uh, this being uh, several weeks now at least, uh, for majority of the uh, of the, um, organizations, if people get more used to the work, work at home, perhaps they will feel more comfortable and uh, and also build up some discipline. I think discipline is very important uh, when one works at home on a regular basis, on a daily basis. So I would think this probably will give uh, another thing for all the business to to think about is uh, whether uh, how how they weigh the benefits and also the demands uh, of a work at home. I think to certain industry, uh, certain businesses, perhaps work homes. Uh, will be will be more uh, more efficient because you save the, some commute time, uh, and uh, be, be person uh, uh, individually can have a little more flexibility. Flexibility doesn't mean uh, will be uh, random. I think flexibility is still follow the uh, the certain certain disciplines. I, I think this is another thing. Uh, perhaps the will be the lingering impact to uh, to the overall uh, uh, business. Uh, by this uh, by by this pandemic. Right. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So last year, Jenny, you saw yeah. uh, you you were privileged to hear Warren Buffett, the Oracle of Omaha, speak, uh, and then you wrote a subsequent article, "Learn from the Wise." So looking back at that event through today's lenses, what were your takeaways from that event, and what, if anything, can we apply in today's uncertain times? Sure, you know, for 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 uh, through today's uh, lens. Uh, actually, um, my takeaway, even getting uh, more profound in terms of that is uh, learn from the from the wise. I think it's more a we we should be more engaged, more in, in, inversive, and uh, to take advantage of this competitive uh, uh, benefits by learning from the wise. I think more uh, more than ever. I sensed uh, o- over the years is that, uh, you know, we, we all make a lot of some mistakes. You know, some people make more, some people make less. I think the wisdom is that power is to uh, perhaps uh, make us make less mistakes. You learn from other people's wisdom that we can make le- less uh, less mistakes. And uh, normally the, 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 the true wisdom does not come from schooling. You, you can stay in school for many years, but it may, you may not really gain a lot of wisdom. You learn a lot of uh, information and you, you may get certain knowledge. And also just to go through many years of a, uh, we call the journeyman jobs. You know, we all have jobs. We just go through the one job to the other job. And, uh, but the wisdom is really comes from very conscientious learning and a very deep thought process and the lifelong exposures to versatile, different uh, versatile endeavors. This is how the wisdom come, come, come really uh, uh, can be uh, uh, formed. So uh, in, in addition to Warren Buffett's uh, investment uh, wisdom, I try to uh, follow, try to learn. I personally, uh, uh, try to learn uh, the 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 word and the, and the spirit of uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln and Winston Churchill and Confucius. Those are the three more uh, people I look at there. That is a great their, triangle uh, of of uh, of of insight. Uh, Winston Churchill, Abraham Lincoln, and Confucius. That's that's I like that. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, I think if you make them together, they really learn a lot. You know, to to look at a different thing, whether it's uh, uh, our our jobs uh, and uh, dealing with people or handling personal personal life, and uh, even you know grow the grow the business. So I I, I found it's I just feel with the pandemic and you know, with this thing, I think the, the wisdom is even more important 
uh, 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 than than ever. And uh, especially in in uncertain times, you know, we all feel a lot of uncertainties lately. And uh, wisdom is a power. And uh, because uh, I think it really give us a confidence and it gave us a resilience. And those is a really uh, important uh, bedrock uh, for uh, doing things right and doing things well. As a back to the Peter Drucker, you know, says, you know, you, we want the efficiency and effectiveness, basically right and well. That's really the, the important thing. And also with forward looking, I found them, uh, the people I just quoted, and uh, uh, they, they really always have, you know, forward looking, uh, forward looking regardless of the century they, they, they were in. And uh, so, you know, and, and, uh, and to answer your question, I feel, you know, in uncertain times uh, through this uh, uh, pandemic, uh, I think learning from the wise even more important than ever. Yeah, very good. You know, you talk about um, education providing information and, to paraphrase, experience providing wisdom. Uh, I've, we've brought this up in this particular topic up on the show several times before, but it's the gentrification of our industry, of the electronic assembly industry, that the old sages uh, in our industry, older wise sages in our industry are quickly approaching retirement. And the number of, you know, young-blooded um, enthusiastic, recently graduated people are very slowly entering our industry. And the, it used to be that every large company that could afford it, every deep pocketed company would have someone like yourself or, or, or a, uh, a sagey kind of person who was, re who was the Warren Buffett of their company, the Oracle of their company. And they would know where all the process skeletons were buried. And they would know a lot about uh, a lot of different things. And those people are retiring. And there are really very few subject matter experts left at companies anymore. Uh, when they go, they're not replaced uh, with that kind of wisdom. So do you, do you see that in our industry? Do you see that there's a fix for that in our industry? Do you think that that we're losing a lot of the wisdom that has been built up over the years and replacing it with smart people, but without the experience? Is that, is that your experience as well? Yeah, I, I think perhaps there, there's just some gap there. Um, but one thing, Mike, what, what you are doing you know, with this uh, podcast, uh, you, you provide one source of the, you know, intellectual, you know, wisdom to, to everyone, right? You, you, you're doing so many uh, podcasts. I was, uh, I didn't get a chance to ask you yet. I'm very curious about, you know, where, where you, how did you come up with this idea to, to do all the, you know, uh, uh, the additional work for, uh, uh, for, 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 the, for the industry, which is uh, very valuable, I think, to the younger. Well, I, th I think the, the, you know, my impression of, well, I started in this industry in 1985. Uh, we've both been in this industry a long time. And back in the old days, us old folks can say that, back in the old days, the magazines were writing editorial. Uh, it, you, people would have in their collection of technical things on their bookshelf before the internet, they'd have the um, Granger book and the Thomas uh, books and, and all the reference materials. And they'd keep every back issue of every industry magazine. And that was a resource for how to do problem solution, technical uh, articles, things like that. And then with some exception, there are magazines today that are still very editorial, very technical. And then there are others that are just advertisements. Send in a press release that you changed your toilet paper from one ply to two ply. They'll publish that. You know, it's, it's kind of trashy. And, and I saw a degradation of quality, non-commercial, emphasis on non-commercial resources out there. Everything is a commercial. Even a lot of the, the conferences you go to, some of the talks you go to, there's commercialism built into it, which, which dilutes the entire conference. So uh, I wanted to start something where I can talk about, uh, talk to subject matter experts like yourself and others and strip out all the commercial part of it and just talk about best practices, best practices in every aspect of 
electronic manufacturing that would drive reliability. And I didn't see that in, in a lot of other uh, venues. So I thought, well, let's just, let's just do that. I don't make any money if someone sells a reflow oven. I don't need to promote a reflow oven or a, or a printer mm -hmm. or, or whatever, or a service. So let's just get these people in here, uh, forget that they're, they work for a particular company, and let's just talk uh, in general about best practices. And I thought I'll do one or two, and this is episode number 43. So it just keeps going. <laughs> people keep returning my calls. I don't know why. It's crazy. Well, I, I, again, I, I think uh, it, it's tremendous for you uh, to do this uh, for, for, the, for, the, for the industry. I'm pretty sure uh, all the, um, the people, uh, particular um, people, they just enter the industry will be uh, benefited. Uh, I hope tremendous. so. That's the goal, that, that this is kind of a, a legacy thing. And good information is good information. It's timeless. And, and uh, you know, some technical aspects might change. But a lot of the stuff that my guests provide on this on this show are, are timeless uh, advice so well we'll see time will tell let's talk about reliability when I when I sent you when I asked you if you would be on the program you warmed my heart with your response you said reliability is an important subject and it's also one of my favorite subjects to quote you uh, so almost every guest on this program speaks about reliability from a very narrow focused perspective as I as I said earlier we'll bring an expert on reflow or on printing on PCB fabrication on x-ray things like that I believe your experience relative to reliability is from a much wider perspective I call it the 30,000 foot perspective or press box perspective so when it comes to reliability of circuit assemblies where are we as an industry what's the state of the state of, of our industry and uh, what do we do well in your opinion and what needs to be improved in your opinion and and what's the path forward to increased reliability? Yes, uh, for, first, probably just step back a little bit about uh, uh, what, what do we say when we say reliability? What, what, really does, what, what does that mean? First, the reliability is a relative term in my mind. And uh, I mention this to the audience every time I um, uh, had a chance or teach my professional development courses. So I wanted the audience to understand, uh, not looking for or search for uh, a absolute number. And uh, I, I think it's, uh, if, if when we look at the, you mentioned a lot of publications, some publications uh, uh, perhaps, uh, you know, really, really less than ideal uh, or less than desirable, it really not teaching that much or not really providing enough information, looking at one single number. So reliability, pragmatically, particular, uh, in, in particular, is based on three domains. The time, meaning how long, and environment, like a use case, service conditions, conditions, functionality, target performance. So that is saying the product should be designed, manufactured, and used for a target reliability. So because reliability is not, say, perfection, and reliability refers to the probability of failure. So that is really when we look at our industry or other industry, when we say reliability is operational reliability, not idealistic, you know, type of reliability. And also there's always a cost factor involved. So under the engineering principle, the higher reliability is associated with a higher cost. And uh, we normally don't want to hear that, but the, in a way that is the, the, the engineering really uh, based on. So because we wanted to know what is the early wear in failure rate and what is the later stage of product life, regardless what kind of product, the wear out failure rate. So they both would be balanced. That really calls for the, the cost factor. So, you know, early wear in failure normally linked with a design. You know, if we have a higher, that's in poor design mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and less than quality assembling process, process issues, uh, errors, or insidia defects related to the production. So that's it early failure, but then we have a intrinsic wear out failure rates. 
that is the design for the level of the reliability. So it's coming right from the beginning, the offsite of the product, uh, the concept, and therefore lead to, to the design. For example, in our industry, okay, uh, reliability level required to design and uh, produce a military or non-military satellite. You know, so inside the, uh, the, the brain and function is electronic hardware. So that satellite must deliver a minimum 15 years, minimum, maybe 30 years of service life and a harsh radiation environments. So that kind of design and the reliability will be very different from designing and producing our, we all love the smartphones, you know, mm -hmm. indispensable. Yeah. <laughs> that needs three, four years life. And uh, for the for the gadget lovers, it may be just one year. You know, you know, some people just change the phones every every year. So I, I think so. So that's what a little background when we look at the uh, re reliability. You know, some th that's really perhaps uh, uh, related to what you just mentioned. How how the uh, the information, the publication is ended. There there's so many uh, publication. I have to say. I kind of agree with you that is the, the quality publications is quite in the in a small percentage. So, as to our industries, the past and the present and future, I think you you just alluded. Uh, you know, we've been in the industry uh, for a long time. I, I think I had to give some credit, you know, to to all the people involved. It, it's uh, to just by observing and uh, engaged uh, intimately in the changing industry because uh, in our industry as a packaging assembling particularly, uh, we, we are not really the driver in an intrinsic sense because the driver is still coming from uh, you know, upper, uh, 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 upper stream, that is semiconductors. So we are kind of respond to very quickly, timely, to see how we're going to make the semiconductor work to the way we intended to. So I think our response time, our uh, problem uh, solving has been very, very well, in quite, a, quite a challenging, but it seems all the problems are solved. So, uh, so, uh, so I'm kind of proud of uh, industries in, in, in this regard, uh, in certain level of innovation, in, in the level of the perseverance, and the consistency in producing, uh, in producing the product, regardless of what type of uh, uh, product. Obviously, all the equipment that you see it is all uh, involved. I, I'm just summarizing time, environment, functionality, kind of a, a triangle approach to, or three-legged approach to reliability. Uh, and you're right. A lot of people, when they think about reliability, they, they think about the product has to last forever. As you stated, if, if it's a cell phone, it probably should last two years because that's the time between contracts with most cell phone companies. So, and, and the relevancy, you know, the, the, when it comes to high tech gamey kind of things that every year or two, they're, they're just obsolete whether they're still working or not. So I, I guess if a game company wanted to build a game console that would last a hundred years, they would be wasting an awful lot of money, leaving a lot of money on the table. <laughs> Because right, right. after a year and a half, you know, kids aren't going to want to play with that one anymore anyway. So uh, it is, a, as you stated, it, it is definitely a relative, a relative subject uh, when it comes to reliability. And then there's planned yeah. obsolescence, things like that. You know, uh, maybe you don't want right. it to last forever. Maybe a, a model where a product lasts forever is bad for business. So um, yeah. all that has to be has to be factored in. Right. Those are good points. Right. So you wrote way back, we're going to go in your time machine, back to 1991, <laughs> right. when you were uh, nine years old. Uh, you wrote, with, with <laughs> okay, the ever I'll take that. <laughs> I'll take it, yeah, sure. Uh, with the ever-changing, ever-demanding, and ever-competitive electronics industry, and this is back in 1991, we have to continue to establish these building blocks for better and more reliable performance via improving existing materials or innovating new materials for targeted applications. And, and you also wrote... The most challenging aspect of electronic material is its interdisciplinary nature. Now, this could have been written today with probably even more relevancy. So what's changed from the ever-competitive, ever-changing, ever-demanding nature of the electronics industry written in 1991? Has it gotten worse today from, from, from that 
that description or better? Or what, what's your opinion today from then? Yeah, I, I see our industry. If you look at it uh, today, I think uh, I think our industry is very well situated in um, in today's technology, in manufacturing know-how, and mostly, I think, problem-solving ability in every step, stage or module, if we look at the production flow. And whether it's the printing paste, the reflow, component placement, cleaning, inspection, and the testing. However, I think there are more to be done. I want to give two examples, uh, which I personally have been uh, waiting and looking for many years. I still, uh, I think, uh, yet to be done. One is a solder joint reliability, the other is PCB reliability. How so? And I just simply uh, put, uh, there's a disconnect in solder joint reliability in terms of uh, really fully utilize the metallurgical science engineering in order to get the ultimate reliability in the practical sense. Second, the, the PCB, I, I take two basic ba base material. PCB base material falls short from the ideal. So, and I, you know, why, why, why I'm saying that, for, for example, the PCB material, uh, I posed the question or challenge to the industry, I would say 35 years ago, even longer. Uh, that is, we need innovation to come up with PCB material that offers all of the desire, desired or required characteristics. The keyword is all. So, for example, in including the electrical properties, the physical stability, thermal stability, heat resistance, whether it's represented by TG or TD, uh, uh, moisture resistant, flame re resist, uh, resistant or retardant, and, uh, and the low cost. But today, uh, we have a different resin polymer based system. Yes, we, you know, industry as a whole did uh, come out with a uh, different from a traditional epoxy. Uh, polyamide, uh, BT, uh, resins, uh, uh, bismol, uh, leo, uh, imide, uh, triazine, uh, cyanate, uh, ester, uh, polyphenolene, uh, and ether. We have all this material. Yes, each one of them can perform to the certain conditions. However, we had to trade off among this material. So, that meaning is we cannot have it all still after more than three decades. It, it, it takes a breakthrough innovation to achieve it, and uh, but we still don't have it. So that is what you know. One example, you know, more more things um, uh, 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 can be done. You know, uh, I mentioned earlier about you know and doing the right things well. So what is right things in in our horizon? It is really able to timely and uh, very swiftly deploy new technologies to achieve another level of manufacturability. So there's new technology. What are really different? I think you mentioned 1991 and and uh, and today. Uh, my perspective uh, really has not changed, but however, technology landscape has changed. And they are potent new tools have become available, which we didn't have uh, in, in, in the past. So the, uh, the, 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 the industry can utilize those technologies and uh, to, for example, to efficiently, effectively generate, collect, analyze, and use data. That's a big word, data. And how to leverage machine learning to put the data in use as intended and how to further use the deep neural learning to take a full advantage of data with the increased intelligence. So we cannot say, you know, how intelligent it's going to be, but we're certainly looking for in increased uh, uh, in, in intelligence. So in manufacturing, back to our electronics uh, hardware manufacturing, what would we need? It's not automation, and uh, it's about beyond automation. That is, includes to get the adequate visibility, traceability, predictability, simulations, and intelligent autonomy. So it's really the challenge today. What we need to have is a holistic system approach by using those uh, new 
technologies, which we didn't have before. I think that's going to put a, uh, we can call the opportunity, we can call it the, uh, the challenge to the industry up today. So overall, you know, it, it, it was a 30, this has been more than 30 years later, you know, time really flies, Mike. You know, I, I really don't, frankly, I don't, really don't feel, uh, you know, that long. <laughs> it seems just a very short time ago. Uh, but, but, but I think that's a new thing. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, my perspective. In terms of materials, I give a couple examples. One is solder, one is PCB. And uh, the, uh, you're, you're absolutely right. You know, it's still relevant in, in both accounts. The role of material and the nature of uh, interdisciplinary, uh, uh, inter interdiscipline. So in, in the broad sense, when we say material, it means mean, uh, all type of materials, ceramic, metallic, and the polymer, polymeric materials. I give one example about the polymer material, which is PCB resin, which is so critical. You know, you know some of the defects, production defects, most prevalent production defects for the last, uh, say, 10 years or so, is was really introduced uh, by the PCB material. You know, you really rely on the PCB material, a lack of the certain uh, certain characteristic. Of course, PCB material problem induced by the process, you know, and the process induced by certain, you know, temperature uh, requirement, for example, by the by the lead free. So that's the kind of thing I think we've been had we've been working on and we uh, we will continue should uh, should uh, work. So in a sense, uh, future uh, is for our for challenging and uh, and the opportunity. As about the breakthrough innovation, I think it's certainly there's an entirely new uh, uh, category of material, so called the two uh, D or two dimensional material. Uh, that really shows high promise for electronic devices down the road, and uh, uh, this category of material is able to uh, to really change uh, revolutionarily on the electronic devices. And so far, uh, we we still can't rely on silicon, even uh, uh, there's, a, there's a debate, but we, 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 we're still uh, doing pretty well based on silicon. But once the 2D material becomes uh, available, uh, that is after the, uh, the material is able to uh, move to another level in terms of practical stability and manufacturability. Then we will see the totally different uh, world of um, uh, of electronics. So that's something uh, down the road in terms of electronics. Very good. A couple of the takeaway bullet points I'm, I'm hearing. I heard the word data. I heard the word holistic. Do you think uh, Industry 4.0 will 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 be a uh, a key to the need to capture data in a, in a more holistic approach? Sure, 4.0, I, I think uh, depends on how how we approach it. That, that really uh, controls uh, how fast uh, you can, pre, uh, can, pro, uh, can progress. And uh, uh, that is the reason I was mentioning, you know, uh, if we look at 4.0, it's just increased level of automation, then we probably lose the, some of the spirit of 4.0. Uh, it, it's way beyond that. We, we really have to look at the uh, the whole system. You just like say the overall the surface run production line. You know, uh, we we seen some of the uh, new additions and new uh, intelligence putting into it. But really, it's how to link them uh, together. Uh, really, how to use the the data uh, and how to generate the 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 the, the data and. Uh, analyze data and clean the data. I think those are the pretty pretty challenging. Certainly, I think 4.0 uh, is uh, representing the, what the manufacturing industry going to go um, go for. Uh, but but uh, it all depends on how we utilize these tools right. in a timely fashion. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Jenny, tell me a little bit about your business. What is your business? What is your business model? What do you offer your customers. Well, right now our business model is not on the on the daily basis. Of course, uh, overall we, we still deal with the manufacturer on the daily basis. We are not as a hands on, you know, and to to run the production line. Uh, right now we are trying to really give the 
uh, good 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 uh, uh, input or uh, advice uh, to uh, our clients, and uh, whether they are doing the uh, the uh, boutique manufacturer uh, manufacturing or doing the very high volume of the, in the uh, consumer products or the high uh, high uh, reliability mission critical uh, products. So so what my uh, mission right now is to provide uh, the uh, the advice to uh, to the industry and uh, hopefully will be helpful to, to the industry going to the next level of um, manufacturing excellence. Very good. Uh, and, and to our audience who would like to get a hold of, of Jenny, um, her contact information uh, and website information will be on the show notes. So go to our main page, well, on Spreaker.com, Spreaker, S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R.com, where the show is hosted, and you'll be able to reach out to Jenny uh, if, if you would like. Jenny Huang, thank you so much for being my guest today. I, I was looking forward to this interview, and certainly you did not disappoint, Not what I, uh, nor would I expect you to. It was a very uh, insightful uh, interview, and thanks for all the information that you provided. Sure, Mike, and uh, thanks, uh, thanks again for uh, posting very interesting questions uh, again, and really made me uh, think and think hard. I, I, I am embracingly welcome uh, the the questions. So I also very enjoy our conversation, and uh, uh, also again, thank you for offering uh, the podcast to the industry. I'm sure it's very valuable to everyone. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate the kind words. Thanks, Jenny. You are. Thank you, Mike. Bye bye. Well, that's another episode. Thanks for listening to the Reliability Matters podcast. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe to Reliability Matters on iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or wherever you get your podcast. Reliability Matters and other reliability-based podcasts are available at Circuit Assembly's PCB Chat at pcbchat.com and at Ascendo Reliability at reliability.fm. Thanks for your comments. Please keep them coming. Send comments and episode suggestions to Mike at MikeConrad.com. That's Conrad with a K. Until next time, thanks for listening and keep doing it right. Thanks for listening to the Reliability Matters podcast. Join us on the second and fourth Tuesday of each month for new episodes of Reliability Matters.